Choose Linux, episode 14, for July 25th, 2019. Hello and welcome to the show that captures the excitement of discovering Linux. I'm Joe. I'm Drew. And I'm Mel. And here we are for episode 14. We've got a ton to talk about, but first of all, we need to address something. Last time we talked about Plex and Cody, and pretty much everyone listening got in touch with us to say, hey, why didn't you talk about MB and Jellyfin? And so, uh, yeah, I think we have to answer why we didn't talk about that. MB is the kind of open source alternative to Plex, and Jellyfin is a fork of that that stripped out any of the kind of paid aspects of it. So, Drew, why did we not talk about MB or Jellyfin? I wanted to talk about Plex because that's a system that I've been using for a long time. And I do have a lot of family and friends that do connect to my services. So for one, moving them over to something else would be quite a bit of work on my end and their end. And a lot of my users are not really hyper technical. So getting them to install something that's probably not in the official app stores for whatever their devices, the Roku or what have you, could be difficult because I'm not going to be walking my parents through trying to sideload some application. Uh, On top of that, the application ecosystems just are not where I want them to be yet for either one of those applications. Now, to their credit, Jellyfin did reach out to me on Twitter and answered a few of my questions regarding their direction. And I am happy to say that they are working on their app ecosystems. But there's still no support for certain consoles. That's right. They are not targeting the Xbox or the PlayStation 4 at the moment, or really any other consoles, due to the difficulty in getting apps into those app stores, which is very unfortunate for me, especially because a lot of my friends are using consoles as their main media consumption devices these days. And until that particular aspect is resolved and they can start using those devices, it's unlikely that I'll really be able to switch. Well, that sounds reasonable. And so there's your explanation, everyone who wrote in. So can I say, for the love of Linux, please stop emailing us about it now? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. Yeah, we know. All right, well, let's start this time with Endeavor OS. Now, it wasn't long ago, I think it was maybe a month or so ago, Antogos announced that they were shutting down. And Antogos is the easy way to install Arch, essentially, with some value add as well, to be fair. And around the time of the announcement, shortly afterwards, a group of people said, hey, we want to continue it, and we're going to call it Endeavor OS. And I was skeptical, I must say, that it was going to actually happen. But about a week ago, they released their first stable release, so I thought we'd better check that out, especially as it's got XFCE. And I must say, I was quite impressed with it. But L, you had some problems, right? Okay, so I will just be straight honest and say I have never used Arch before. So I was going into trying this completely new. And, you know, I always say it's okay to be new. So I thought, why not just jump in? Don't do it in a VM. Don't do it on a backup machine. Just kick to it and use it. So I've been on Pop! OS for two months and I wiped everything off and going through the install process, I was really excited. I kept hearing about how difficult it was to use Arch because half the journey was just switching over to it. The prompts were really easy. It even gave me the option of dual booting. It's like a little slide bar to you know how big you want what partition to be. Everything's going great. Take out the USB, restart, and I have no Wi-Fi. Like It looks like the Wi-Fi card is just non-existent. So I'm on my phone and I'm looking and I'm running into other people who have had the same issue and they're just like, you know what, turn it off and turn it on again. And I didn't know that was actually a solution on Linux, but that's what I did. (laughs) And when I came back, it was there and I was like, okay, we can get started. We can kind of start moving around. And the first thing I usually do is jump in and just kind of change the way things look to fit the way that I like it. And I'm a very dark themed kind of person. I loved how easy you just left clicked and all of the prompts were there to change backgrounds, to change the color themes, to change your toolbar. But then I wanted to configure my headphones and I use 
Bluetooth headphones. Well, trying to use Bluetooth headphones on Linux is just a disaster in my experience, so I'm not surprised you had problems. I didn't realize how difficult it would be. Every other system I've used has just been click on the Bluetooth button and connect them. But this was like, okay, you need to install, you know, Blues and Blue Utils. And even when I did that and it's restart the service, the service wasn't there. And I'm looking through the log files. And I have to say that I, I did hit the limits of my ability to know how to troubleshoot. And when I went looking for the docs, the Arch docs are there, which was what I was following. However, there were no docs specifically for this project. So... I think it's going to be something I keep an eye on, but it's definitely not going to be my daily driver yet. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you had so many issues with it, Elle. Uh, I used Arch pretty solidly from 2005 until somewhere around 2015. So I'm pretty well versed in the system, but I had never actually used Antergos. Uh, so when I went to install the system, I found it really easy. Now, you are trading out some of the flexibility that you get with stock Arch for the ease of installation through their Calamari's installer. But for most users who just kind of want to dip their toes in the Arch waters, this is perfect. And while they do have a couple of issues with the offline installer right now, they are presented right up front telling you exactly what those issues are and how to avoid them, which I really appreciated. Yeah, this was as easy as Ubuntu or Fedora to install for me, and I would have gone for XFCE anyway, and it's got a nice theme, everything seems to be set up quite sensibly, so next time I install Arch for whatever reason, if I want to test some software that's brand new or whatever, then this is going to be my go-to, definitely. Absolutely, and I'm really interested to see what happens with the online installer when they get that going, because they're going to offer upwards of 10 desktop environments that you can install directly from this system, which I think is great. They make it really easy to use the AUR as well, don't they? They do. Once I got in there, I was looking at some of the packages that they have installed by default, and an AUR helper is right there ready to go. They're using Yay as opposed to some of the older ones like Yaourt or PackR. And really, I thought Yay is the best one that I've ever used. One of the other applications that they have installed by default is Kalu, which is an updater and news aggregator for Arch-specific news, which I found pretty interesting. It displays notifications as soon as you log in, telling you if you have application updates available or if any new articles have been posted to the Arch website. And it lets you perform updates through a graphical updater, which I really like. One thing I wondered about that, though, is if there was a way to configure how things were loading. Because what I ran into is, for some reason, it was attempting to make connection to pull that information before actually bringing up my Wi-Fi connection. So when that happened, I started getting errors like, you know, unable to check the news, unable to check for updates, and it was just constant pop-ups. And then one really strange error about VirtualBox client and the VirtualBox kernel service not running... But as soon as Wi-Fi came up, then everything cleared out. So I'm guessing something was out of order, but it just wasn't something that I was comfortable enough trying to troubleshoot to actually file a bug report with. It kind of sounds like they do need an option in Kalu to tell it to wait X number of seconds before it starts checking things just to make sure that your Wi-Fi comes up or maybe even just hook into Network Manager. Yeah, maybe they should add a sleep 10 and and to it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> The only other thing that I really wanted to mention about Endeavor OS is I was curious as to why ZenMap was installed by default. Now, did you actually get ZenMap up and working? Because when I would try to load it, it just kept erroring out on me. You know, I never actually tried to launch it. I just saw it and had that little question mark pop up on, over my head, wondering why it was there. And interestingly, I think this is one of the first graphically installed operating systems that I've seen in a while that doesn't come with an office suite. I didn't even think that to think about it being missing. That That's interesting. But it's easy enough to install LibreOffice or something. That's true. Although that does bring up one other point. There's no graphical application installer included here. So anybody who is wanting to get started with this system should already be at least partially comfortable with the command line. Well, thankfully, Pac-Man is pretty straightforward. Once you know that you just have to do Pac-Man dash capital S and then name of thing that you want to install, that's all you need to know, really. Or you can cheat like I did and just install Snaps. 
But is that really cheating? I mean, Arch Linux is kind of designed to allow you to do whatever you need to do. And it really just kind of ingests all of the upstream applications from everywhere that they can. So I think snaps are considered fully supported. All right. Well, I wanted to talk about something that I've rediscovered recently, and that is NewPipe. And this is uh, an Android app which is open source and it's on F-Droid, or you can just download the APK if you want to. And what it is is a YouTube player that pretty much gives you YouTube premium features without having to pay. I have to thank you for recommending this, Joe, because you are now one of my kids' favorite people. <laughs> I'm that person that does not pay for the unlimited data plan. So I am very much like watch videos at home, wait till you're connected onto Wi-Fi. So it's now on each one of their phones and they love the ability just to go in and download YouTube videos. And the really cool thing that I saw my kids doing was actually downloading skateboard tutorials, taking it outside and watching while they were doing. So it was a really nifty function that I don't have to pay for. So I'm really happy about it. I love this as well, just for the feature where you can have it play in the background rather than having to keep that YouTube app up and your screen on the entire time you're trying to listen to something. It is great for if you're trying to just check out a podcast or something real quick without having to you know, sign into YouTube, have it up on your screen and using up all your battery life. Now I can just set it and forget it and go mow the lawn. Yeah, I use it to watch a lot of news content where you don't really need the video. It's mostly just people talking or political discussion and stuff like that and um, like scientific lectures and all sorts of stuff and music as well sometimes. So that background feature is just amazing. Also, I love the fact that you can choose the quality. I was out at the gym the other day and the Wi-Fi there is so terrible that even on the lowest quality, I couldn't stream it. I think I have four gigabytes of data per month. So... I well, I can't remember what I was watching now. I think I think I was watching some news thing or whatever. And um, by being able to set the quality to one forty four p, which is just really terrible quality, but it was good enough for what I wanted to watch at the time. I was able to save a ton of data that way. And what I also love about it is you can subscribe to channels without having to have a YouTube account or a Google account. And you can even import your existing subscriptions from the YouTube app. They make it really, really easy to do that. Oh, wow. I hadn't even found that feature yet. That's great. The only thing I miss from the official YouTube app is the recommendation algorithm, which is kind of hit and miss, really. And it has some good points and some bad points. Obviously, it means that Google are farming all your data. But I do actually find that quite useful sometimes when they recommend you'll kind of watch one video and then you'll get a bunch more related to it. And a lot of the time it's annoying, but sometimes it's really useful and you end up with loads of interesting videos. And so you don't have that feature in here. But I think a lot of people who care about privacy and stuff would not care about the recommendations. Besides, that's how you get stuck in a loop. Just video after video after video. And then all of a sudden, it's morning. I thought that was the point of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one last thing I wanted to mention that I had a bit of fun with was the ability to make playlists. And it was really simple. I just went to the video that I wanted, made a playlist, told it which one it wanted it to belong to. So by the end of it, I actually had, you know, more of a professional playlist of things I wanted to follow. And then I had a music one. And I think halfway through, I started thinking, you know, I could probably cancel my Spotify uh, subscription at this point. Well, the fact that it's basically giving you YouTube premium features, I would imagine, is why it's not in the Play Store and why you have to get it from F-Droid. And I would recommend getting it from F-Droid so that you can stay updated rather than just downloading the APK. But one feature that I like, it's, it's only a little thing, but it's really nice. If you're on a video's page, then you've got either the comments or then you can just swipe to get the related videos and then you can swipe back again and it's just a nice little ui touch that um, they've obviously thought quite a lot about because i had used it before it, mu it must be a couple of years ago and it just it was good but it wasn't quite as polished as it is now it just seems like a really finished product really like something that is just can compete with the proprietary app that it's kind of replacing so i would highly recommend it do check it out new pipe Okay, distro hoppers then. And last time the random distribution button, 
on DistroWatch gave us PySide Linux or PC or whatever. And this is a Turkish distribution that seems to be obsessed with cats. So how did you two get along with it? You know, I, I had a great time. I don't know if you caught on that the reason that everything is cat-based is because it's based on Pardus Linux, P-A-R-D-U-S, which is the Turkish word for kitty. So they're just kind of having fun with the theme. Um, I did have to go look to see how it was named, and it actually stands for Packages Installed Successfully as Intended. So I had a lot of hope, and it, the install process was pretty much the way that everything you would expect. And then once you get the install done, you're greeted by Capitan, which is just kind of like your own personal guide to setting up your workspace. I think this is a wonderful product or kind of wonderful tool for anyone who is new because it walks you through setting up, you know, what do you want your click behavior to be? What should your button behavior be? Do you want widgets, your color scheme? It, to me, once you're able to personalize your environment, like I've talked about before, it just kind of really becomes your environment and your desktop. So that was a really wonderful tool that I was excited to see. You know, I was really impressed by this tool as well. And in fact, I went and took a look to see uh, if this was something that originated in uh, PC Linux or PyC Linux. And sure enough, it is. This is a bespoke tool that they have written that it appears some distributions are starting to adopt as well. And it really does a great job of setting up the default Plasma environment in a way that is attractive to individual users. Like you can select where your bar location is, as well as the other things that L mentioned. And it is really, really slick. I was very impressed with that. Now, L, you had some trouble with package installation, isn't that right? So it's kind of funny that the distribution is called packages installed successfully as intended. And that didn't happen at all, ever. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go in and first of all, all of the help docs are written in Turkish and I could not find their English counterparts. So I'm having to kind of do a Google translate on the page. And as I'm going through it, I'm getting the gist that the packages, especially when it comes to kind of third party repos and applications like Slack are hosted on GitHub. So you need to go in and clone the repositories and then use PC as an install, so no apt, no, you know, yum. It was just kind of confusing trying to translate everything out. So I must admit that it took me a good probably four hours to figure out how to install packages. How did you guys fare? I was much quicker than that. I just used the GUI package manager and um, managed to get stuff installed really quickly after about 10 minutes. Not even that. Although I didn't see any updates available ever, which I found a bit strange and disconcerting. It's interesting you should mention that because I did get updates available and I did try to install them. And here's where things kind of went sour for me. I was really ready to just recommend this as a great distribution for anybody who has a cat loving relative or friend who's not very good with computers and wants something that's good for web browsing, you know, light email, that sort of thing. Except I ran these updates, rebooted and had a non-working system. It turns out that Dbus happened to break completely, and I was no longer able to log into Plasma on a desktop environment session. So that kind of threw a wrench in things for me, and I really hope that they can get that fixed. Joe, it's interesting to me that you say that you know it took about 10 minutes for you to be able to get things through the GUI. I couldn't find other kind of proprietary, I guess, like Discord and Slack applications through their GUI. Um, but the things that I was able to find during through their GUI took forever to install. It got to the point that I started making notes on how long things took. And so it took a full 10 minutes to install the SSH packages. Oh, I didn't experience that, I don't think. I mean, I, I tend to multitask when I'm doing these things. So maybe it took longer than normal, but I, I don't really recall that at all. It just seemed to be a kind of standard amount of time, really. So that's strange. I guess we should note that we live pretty far away from one another. So maybe that had something to play in with it. It's possible. Here on the East Coast, the package delivery wasn't too bad. 
maybe a little longer than say updates from somewhere in England or anything like that, but it wasn't unreasonable for me. One issue I had is that it just boots to the console and then you have to log in and then start X. Uh, that's no problem for me, but I can't imagine the average new user knowing what to do in that situation. I noticed that as well, but on my end, I had rebooted the system at one point and I had just been letting it sit while I was working on some other things and it did eventually get to the light DM login screen. So I'm wondering if it's possibly just that it's really slow getting that light DM up. Ah, that makes sense. That must be it because yeah, I, I do, you know, multitask and I didn't have a problem at all. I had the GUI there waiting for me to go through it. So one thing that did give me pause is I was going through the docs and I'm really hoping that it's just a matter of something being misconfigured in translation. But it seems that they're advertising Linux as being completely problem free. And the line was, it's free, open source. You want, you can access the code, change it how you want. Viruses are no problem. There's no need to check files when you download them from the internet. I'm really hoping that that's not the message that's being sent through to people, that if they use Linux, they don't have to worry anymore. Well, obviously, from a security point of view, that is nonsense. But from the average user, I don't know, that kind of does make sense. I remember I set my mom up with Zubuntu and then just left her to it. And she had tried to watch a bunch of movies and TV shows from like streaming sites or whatever, dodgy ones. And um, I, I had nothing to do with that. That was just her using, I don't know where she found out about it, but anyway. And then I looked in her downloads and there was just a ton of EXE files, which, you know, had just been downloaded accidentally. And if she tried to run those on Linux, so there was no wine installed or whatever, then nothing bad would happen. So from that perspective, it's kind of true that your standard Windows malware is just not going to affect it. But obviously, if you start downloading... Linux binaries and running them as root or whatever, then yeah, that's uh, not going to be a good situation. I don't know. I'm kind of closer to L's line of thinking here. While Linux is a smaller attack target, I would be very hesitant to give a blanket statement that using Linux means that you're not going to have problems or encounter potential security vulnerabilities, because that's simply not true. I don't know. It's it's a hard one because Apple has the same kind of take of, oh, we don't really have viruses. But the reality is viruses and malware do exist for just about everything under the sun. It's just a matter of how prevalent they are. So I do think we should be careful about how we talk about it publicly. Oh, yeah, I, I do agree with that. I mean, I was playing devil's advocate to some extent, really. But yeah, that's the, not really how they should frame it. Although they do that with Chromebooks as well, don't they? Like, um, if you've seen the adverts for that, they're really pushing the, the lack of malware and stuff on that platform. Yeah, you know, I just feel that if we keep with the conversation like this, and we keep advertising Linux as being the platform that doesn't get the viruses, all we're doing is creating a problem where that's where the attackers are going to be focused. You know, as businesses and as more and more people are moving towards Linux and Chromebooks, obviously they're going to start changing malware and adapting viruses to target the spreading platform. Yeah, but unfortunately, our market share is still so low. Maybe not with Chromebooks, but with sort of standard GNU slash Linux. It's so low still compared to Windows that I think it's going to be a long time before that happens, which is kind of good and kind of bad at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a good way of saying it. So we could be hipsters and say we were using Linux long before the viruses found us? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So all in all, then... Uh, it's not going to hang around on any of our machines, I don't think, and we're not going to recommend it to anyone. But it was interesting to see a completely different distro and how they do things. So yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, all right, so let's go to distro watch again then and click the random distribution button. What have we got? Endless OS. Ah, oh, yes, I've used this before. Um, based on Debian stable. And the desktop is EOS Shell, which is uh, kind of a fork of GNOME. And um, yeah, it's a read-only root file system managed by OS Tree. And um, 
Yeah, this is a very interesting distro, actually. This should be pretty cool. I uh, take it you two have never used this. I have not. Not yet. Cool. Well, that should be a good one then. Okay, well, we'd better get out of here then. If you want to get all the future episodes, go to choose slash subscribe, and there's various ways to get those. And you can go to choose linux.show slash contact if you want to get in touch with us. And you can also follow us on Twitter. I'm at L underscore O underscore punk at L O punk. I'm at Drew of Doom. And I'm at Joe Ressington. We'll be back in two weeks with more exciting discoveries. Mm-hmm.